Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to today's lecture on the Interparliamentary Alliance on China. I am Matthias von Binswergen, and I am the Com Commissioner of Intellectual Activities of SIP Groningen, the Dutch United Nations Student Association. I will shortly introduce our topic of today and our speaker, but before I do so, I would first like to hand over the words to our president, Amelia, in order to say a few words about our association. Amelia? Okay, hi, <laughs> now I was able to unmute myself. Uh, I'm Emilia, I'm the candidate president for SIP Groningen of the board of next year. And I'm here together with two of my fellow candidate board members, Linda and Josje. And um, yeah, we're excited to see so many new people here in the stream. Um, we are obviously from the Dutch United Nations Student Association, which is the largest internationally oriented student association here in the city. Um, we have about 50% Dutch and 50% international members, and we organize uh, weekly intellectual events such as lectures or symposiums, as well as uh, drinks after or parties uh, or other social events. Um, and yeah, so um, for Kai Week every day, we had a lot of um, program every evening, uh, usually a lecture followed, like I said, by something social, like a game night. Um, and so tonight, uh, we are very excited for the last lecture of the week. Um, so with that, I'd say I'd give the word back to Matthias. Thank you, Emilia. So, um, all that out of the way, I would now like to reintroduce our topic and our speaker to, for today. Shortly, we will be joined by Sam Armstrong, the Strategies and Communications Coordinator for the Interparliamentary Alliance on China, to say a few words on how we got here in terms of the actions of China in the West, in terms of how the Alliance was founded, and the IPAC's current activities. Also, where the big battles lie in the future for the Alliance and the involved countries. Sam himself has worked on the China front for a few years now, working with the Henry Jackson Society. He has come into contact with parliamentarians, journalists, and various media organizations. As Chinese actions increased in the frequency over the past one and a half years, the society and Sam Armstrong himself has also increased in their coverage, eventually becoming involved with the alliance itself. So shortly, he'll be telling us somewhat about his research and his role and from his uh, perspective uh, uh, from working with the Henry Jackson Society and working with uh, the IPAC itself. Um, and firstly, introducing, of course, the IPAC, what the structure is, what it looks like, and then rolling into the rest of the lecture. Um, thank you, Mr. Armstrong, if we can get a brief round of digital virtual applause. Well, thank you, and thank you very much to uh, uh, the president as well, and thank you to um, Sib uh, for for uh, inviting me along this evening. I've been involved in China for a number of years, but I got involved in it as a think tank uh, communicator. My job is to explain research on complicated issues in a way that engages the public and policymakers, so that they too begin to take them seriously. I first started seriously proposing um, China work in 2017. And back then, the world was a very different place. Uh, the UK was one year on from having declared a golden era of relations with China. This was a, a, a new exciting time in which we were going to trade closer than ever before. Similar episodes had taken place uh, across Europe and indeed across the world. And <clears throat> a, a process that had begun under Deng Xiaoping, the Chinese premier in the 80s and 90s, of gradual opening up of uh, communism uh, with Chinese characteristics taken to mean, to all intents and purposes, capitalism without getting to vote for who's running it, um, had placed China in a position in which more than ever before it was interacting with the world. Now, I come at it uh, as someone who has got a firm belief in Western values. I don't apologize for that. I think it's better for a country to be able to vote for its leaders, to have a strict rule of law, to stand up for liberalism and tolerance and diversity and <clears throat> many of the values we share. And I take quite a stiff line. I, I say those values are empirically better than the alternatives. I think democracy is a superior system to uh, communism, uh, even with Chinese characteristics. Um, so my role back then was really shouting in the wilderness. It was raising the first alerts. 
that China was an issue that we were going to have to begin to take seriously. But I'll be honest, it was difficult. There weren't an awful lot of people ready to listen. And much of the world still considered that uh, we had a future of ever closer trading and uh, collaboration and integration with China. But something very dramatic changed and it changed very quickly. So that we've now arrived two years later and we have entered into, uh, I say this without any hesitation or trepidation, the second Cold War. Historians will look back and they will describe 2020 as the beginning of the, uh, of the Cold War. And like all good wars, people want to know uh, why. I, I can remember years and years at school of uh, lessons on uh, what were the causes of the First World War. And it seems that no one is ever the wiser as to it. Um, so at these moments in time, I think it's helpful to, to, to think about quite how we got here. <clears throat> And it's, a, it's an interesting question uh, to look at it historically and to work out just why a relationship that was on the verge of going real places. I, I don't have any doubts about that either. I think, I think we were about to enjoy um, closer relations with China, dived so quickly and dived not just between two countries, um, and certainly not just the United States, though sometimes it is made out to be, um, why it is that worldwide politicians, parliamentarians, the media have, have begun to very seriously, very quickly question what the activities of the Chinese state are. <clears throat> and the first thing to, to look at is Chinese history. I'm uh, by background a historian. And I always think by zooming out further, you can see more and more of, of the picture of what's going on. And what is very essential to know about China is how it looks at its own history. And China looks at itself as an imperial power. It, it reviews its history. It talks deeply of uh, the various domestic periods. And it considered itself to be a, um, a, an imperial leader of, of just the same might as the United Kingdom perhaps would have done, um, France would have done, etc. <clears throat> It then entered what it calls the, the century of humiliation, where for a series of reasons and a series of events, China was humiliated and its world uh, leading status was steadily eroded until uh, the ultimate culmination in which um, uh, annexation by the Japanese empire left it um, destroyed um, and left its people with a real sense that their rightful place in the world had been chronically undermined. We then engage in um, uh, 70 years of communism, firstly with the disasters in which it frankly uh, was a much worse country then than it is now. And that's an interesting feature of China that actually we, we are not talking about China being as bad as it has been, though we are talking about China being badder than it was at one stage. Um, but back then, China was not really interacting with the world. It was not a member, for example, of the United Nations. Um, that was a, a right given to the Republic of China, who'd, um, <clears throat> what we now call Taiwan, who'd won, who'd lost out in the war, but uh, solicited American backing. And it was, certainly was not well connected to the global economy. China's historic imports of spices, teas, um, had largely been supplanted by uh, India and uh, Indochina by this point. <clears throat> but anyhow, China engaged in a massive uh, industrial revolution under Mao, though it came at great cost, and all was progressing in a kind of slightly isolated, troubled kingdom, as some people called it, um, until Deng Xiaoping came along. Deng Xiaoping was a Chinese premier who viewed with um, great shock the events overtaking the Soviet Union. And his view was that uh, in order for China to um, survive, the Chinese Communist Party to survive, and make no mistake, it is a fundamental policy objective of the Chinese elites to um, solicit the, the perpetration of the uh, Chinese Communist Party as the sole rulers of China. <clears throat> Uh, his view was to open up, he spoke of a win-win situation in which the world could um, trade with China and China could open up its economy, function as a market economy, um, but do so with what he called Chinese characteristics, which um, meant the, the continuation of, of the party as a one-party state. 
And this was fine, and it was fine for about 20 years. Um, and then uh, Deng Xiaoping was replaced by Yunyi Tao, and then eventually with President Xi. Now, President Xi, Xi Jinping, is a fundamentally different creature to anything we have seen before. This is a man who, about whom we know little, but what we do know concerns us deeply. He has shown himself to be ruthless. He has shown himself to be um, somebody who's prepared to do just about anything. And he's also shown himself to be firmly wedded, both to a, a clear idea that um, the Chinese uh, project is under constant threat, and to believe that China has a fundamentally larger role to play in the world than it has done for two to three centuries. <clears throat> And he has uh, hence far demonstrated a willingness to prosecute uh, that agenda insofar as he can. But what is most important to know about Xi Jinping is a document called Document Number no. Nine. The Chinese Communist Party have less uh, imagination, perhaps, than, than we do for for naming of documents. Um, but don't let its uh, anodyne title fool you. This is one of the most important documents written in uh, the 21st century. And in Document Number no. Nine. Um, a, an anonymous Chinese Communist Party official, but it must have been signed off by Xi Jinping himself, uh, set out, um, in, and it was published in 2013, exactly what they saw the great risks to China were. And it was very clear that the, cult the cultural penetration of Western hostile forces, by which it means not groups or individuals, it means ideas, threatens the security of their ideology. And the, Chi the Chinese Communist Party is in an existential war and battle with forces of democracy and of liberalism. And only it or the Chinese Communist Party can win. Uh, it, it has been called the, um, the, uh, the political equivalent of the Harry Potter Lord Voldemort dilemma in that neither can live while the other survives. Uh, uh, and that, that document was circulated amongst the entire senior Chinese um, hierarchy and then very helpfully for, for students of the, such things like myself, it was leaked. <clears throat> uh, and since that point, you have seen a pattern of Chinese aggression and expansion. Um, and that happened for a while, very quietly. So we saw the Chinese aggression in the South China Sea rapidly expanding its places. And then um, having been summoned to the um, International Tribunal on the Law of the Sea, of which it is a party, and had very unusually in uh, uh, diplomatic affairs agreed to, to binding uh, arbitration. It, essentially, he did accepted in advance the jurisdiction of the court, something that China had not done in almost no other exceptions, the World Trade Organization being pretty much the only one. It lost a case um, brought by its near neighbours, not by the West, its near neighbours, who said, look, these, these, these islands are ours, and uh, it simply ignored the ruling. Having done that, uh, I think China was on a path um, to conflict with the West, though people did not know, yet know it. <clears throat> and it wasn't until I would say 2019 that, that real discussions began to, began to happen as to whether the intertwining, the tangling, um, the binding of the rope between China and the West was a wise idea. In the UK, it manifested itself in the debate over Huawei. Huawei is, um, to all intents and purposes, a state-owned Chinese company. Uh, it wanted to install itself in critical national infrastructure. Uh, in other countries, it, it manifested itself differently. In Australia, which has a much closer trading relationship with China, it is much more bound. It manifested itself first in 2017, I think 2018, over um, a potential extradition treaty between China and the United States that a group there called the Wolverines, now part of IPAC, um, fought successfully in the Australian Parliament and had that extradition treaty thrown out. <clears throat> But still, there was, there was a lack of awareness that there was a battle here. There was a beginning of a realisation of the scale of the discussion. I remember being in early discussions amongst uh, UK-China concerned uh, MPs. There was a group here called the Huawei Interest Group, 60 MPs um, who'd committed to vote, Conservative MPs who'd committed to break the vote and vote against their own government in order to reject um, Huawei. 
uh, and there was there was a beginning of a, a, a recognition that hang on this is this is a this is a massively different state here and it could be historically enormous but of course that those debates were ongoing but it wasn't until covid um, or coronavirus that we began to see it and, and that uh, will always be seen as the steps change moment though as i say i think it was bubbling away for three years and with coronavirus we saw very clearly what the consequences were of a nascent superpower breaching its international obligations. <clears throat> Contrary to what um, China and other people have said, uh, China was bound under the um, international healthcare regulations to disclose the existence of any potential future pandemic event within basically in, within 72 hours of the doctor making the first diagnosis. Not only did China not do that, there are ranging of estimates, but it is a minimum of three weeks after which it was confident that um, a, a potential uh, epidemic situation was breaking out in uh, Wuhan, in which it didn't, but it could, could be as much as nine weeks in which the Chinese government sat on that information. As a result, uh, five million people, that's uh, equivalent to, in the UK we say a city the size of Birmingham, it would be a big city, I think, in, in the Netherlands that entered and left Wuhan in that time. It was the Chinese New Year. It was the busiest, it's the busiest single movement of people on the planet without an exception. They took with them a disease and it spread rapidly, uh, first to Italy, uh, to Northern Italy, which has a, a large Chinese uh, emigre population, um, and from uh, Italy to much of Europe um, and from elsewhere uh, around the world. We've all seen the consequences, and I think uh, for many it was a 9-11 scale moment. It was the, the footage, the severity of it was that it has changed people's lives so fundamentally that massive movements were, was, were suddenly able to happen very quickly. <clears throat> but the events didn't happen in isolation. Alongside it, what happened was China became um, more bullish than it had ever been on the global scene, and that takes two forms. So firstly, in terms of actions, China decided to, to all intents and purposes, annex Hong Kong, turning it into a full and wholesome part of the Chinese state. The implementation of the national security law means that the Hong Kong that existed simply no longer um, can be said uh, to, 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 to linger on. Uh, it bans um, any dissent, it bans discussion of democracy, it bans discussion of um, uh, independence, it bans discussion of the, the rule of law. And um, it has already been remarkably quickly implemented. Um, so much so that a friend of mine has now been arrested and will likely spend the rest of his life in prison. And that one of the offences that I believe is likely to be um, particularised is that he spoke to me. And if you or I were to have the same meeting that we are having this evening, you would all be eligible for life imprisonment. And that was a city that 10, 15 years ago was a liberal, modern, not democratic, but broadly functioning part of the, of the global order. And that change happened in three months. But what was, what was even more in, uh, interesting perhaps than, than <clears throat> the, the horrors of it was how proud and bullish and aggressive they were in implementing the change. The Chinese government boasted about it. They, uh, they implemented it in a way that they didn't need to um, in having the Chinese National People's Congress approve it. Um, they had the ridiculous spectacle of 798 people voting for it and one person voting against it. Um, they had press conferences where they defended it. They wheeled out Carrie Lam as this kind of fairly um, uh, pathetic spectre of, of someone who uh, until a few years ago was living in London. Her children went to Cambridge University and Harvard University um, <clears throat> who'd, uh, uh, who'd expressed regret who'd expressed regret six months ago for trying to introduce an extradition treaty with mainland Hong Kong and was now implementing a law that would send any, any Hong Kong dissident to a Chinese gulag for life for the crime of, of wishing democracy. But you saw then something remarkable. 
and, and I think this is really interesting, is that for so long our, our foreign the way we've approached China in foreign policy thinking is to say, well, it's not in China's interests to pursue um, aggressive confrontation with the West, which it is not. <clears throat> and it is not in China's uh, interests to um, keep pushing the buttons, which it is not. And what China wants is to trade and, and to work with us and move closely. And, and yes, look, there are difficult forces here, but ultimately it's reforming. But here they were taking glee in boasting about how outrageously um, authoritarian they could be. And they were taking glee in boasting it not just at home as a, as a tool of repression, but to the world. And that leads me on to the second thing that they have done more recently, which is this so-called wolf warrior diplomacy. In, in which Chinese ambassadors, Chinese diplomats around the world have boasted and taken uh, great enjoyment out of being as aggressive as possible uh, with the world. They will go to, to the world and they will loudly boast uh, to, to the EU press, uh, to the European press, uh, their ambassador to the EU, about how aggressive they were and, and how Europe is, is fundamentally falling away. They will go and tell the Americans that you're pathetic. They will tell the UK that you're pathetic. In Australia, they will not only do that, they will slap tariffs on barley and meat and they will threaten your imports of um, <clears throat> technical goods. And that has been, rem that has been very, very surprising. I, I can't think of a, uh, an instance in global affairs in which a country that is uh, seventy percent reliant on global exports for its economy has gone around the world and told people, um, you know, you're awful, you're dreadful, and 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 so so far provoked them that it has triggered real and meaningful conversations in capitals around the world about decoupling from China, uh, uh, and and the effects of that is that we can no longer have a um, a meaningful or normal discussion of uh, what foreign affairs means with China that is based on assumptions that we do so with, say, Iran, for example. W with Iran, we talk about what's in Iran's interests. If we want to bring Iran to the table, we slap on sanctions. Same, same situation with North Korea. <clears throat> so far, what we're seeing with China is that the, the more we uh, retaliate, the more China retaliates back. And we are not seeing a, a time of a, a sort of building towards a crisis point, at which point we can negotiate and go back better. No, it, rather, what we're seeing is actually China that is rather enjoying itself, just as its fundamental uh, position in the world, its whole national identity uh, is being eroded and, and, and questioned. <clears throat> we're also seeing it just at the time that China is at its most vulnerable domestically very uh, often debated issue. Uh, I don't quite have a view on this as to how vulnerable President Xi is at home. But what I will say is this, is that the Chinese democratic model has been, I'm sorry, not democratic model, the Chinese governance model has been built on um, growth rates of five to 7%. They lie about their own figures, but um, it's, been, it's been based on a, aggressive growth in which an emerging middle class has, has had it better each year than they had it the last. We saw the first sign of that cracking last year with um, shortage of pig supplies. Um, in, in Chinese cuisine, uh, pigs, uh, pork takes up a, a much larger role than it does of, uh, than any other meat does. Um, and there were the first signs of cracks and discontent about lack of uh, ability or the rising prices for pork. But what coronavirus does is it, is it means for the first time that Chinese economy is either going to stagnate or even fall into recession. And that threatens and jeopardizes the, the entire model, all of the assumptions that we have based for a very long time. Um, and, and I think that it is possible that that nervousness is driving Chinese aggression abroad. And there is a need to identify opponents because they are terrified of the um, potential uh, political ramifications of, of a declining economy. But all of this means is that China is 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 behaving like a a bear that's lashing out, but also also a bear that believes it's it's on the march up the hill. So we are seeing, as we have never seen before, or we haven't seen certainly for a long time, perhaps going back to to, to the late 1940s with the emergence of the Soviet Union, 
a, a clear out and out superpower. Um, and there is no doubt that China is a superpower. It, it lacks the military might perhaps. Um, it's only a global power there, I would say. But um, <clears throat> economically in a great number of other ways, it is a superpower fundamentally um, undermining and threatening, jeopardizing the global international order as we have it. And it was into that situation that myself and other colleagues founded the uh, Interparliamentary Alliance on China. Um, it came about from MPs who know each other. Many of them know each other from other issues in countries around the world. Um, early members included um, my very good friend Andrew Hasty, the chairman of the Australian Parliamentary Committee on Intelligence, uh, Reinhard Butikofer, who's a, who's a brilliant German Green MEP, um, Ian Duncan Smith in the United Kingdom, Senator Marco Rubio, um, who has certainly been very active uh, on these issues for a long time, coming together and establishing for the first time uh, an international body of, of parliamentarians. To, to champion the response to China. And the parliamentarians uh, point is, uh, is important uh, in that legislators don't have the full response, uh, the, the full set of responsibilities and need to manage things in the same way as governments do. Governments need to balance things in a very uh, finely tuned way. Um, so if, for example, as is the case in Australia, Australia requested a, the Australian government requested a inquiry into the origins of COVID-19 at the um, International Health Assembly, the governing body of the World Health Organization. In response, um, the Chinese government sma uh, smacked massive tariffs on uh, Australian barley and beef exports and Australian beef farmers and barley farmers will over the next year period lose their jobs. It is a big problem um, and governments have to manage that very closely uh, and, and that causes two problems. <clears throat> the first of which is that governments at times don't get to say the things that I wish they would say. So governments balance their language very carefully and there are times that I think that actually what is required is a moral response on the world stage when we're dealing with something like the, the Uyghur genocide. And my personal view is what is going on in uh, Xinjiang amounts to a genocide, forcing women to have um, to go undergo sterilization is under the genocide convention, uh, genocide. They are, they are trying to eliminate a whole uh, people um, for no other reason than their religion and um, ethnic background. But what legislators can do is they don't need to worry about tempering their language quite as much. They can be bolder and more strident. And when they speak together, when they speak with one voice, the effect is actually China sits up and takes them very seriously. Um, I know they sit up and they take us very seriously because um, our website is hacked routinely um, because um, we all have to change phones and communications devices quite regularly and repeatedly at um, the weekly press conferences held by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in China, um, they amongst uh, they denounced that the uh, IPAC, they've also denounced the Henry Jackson Society, the think tank for, for which I work, um, as well as uh, warmongering, trouble stirring, all the rest of it. Um, <clears throat> so the first thing IPAC set out to do was, was the ability to give a consistent response. Um, that, that said that a, a global body that is not bound by the same problems of international organizations. And I think perhaps we can come back to it in the Q&A. That's a fascinating discussion. Why it is that a lot of countries feel that international organizations, including the UN, have failed in some of these challenges. Um, so, so the first thing we can do we, is we can say that with a big voice. Second thing we can do is, is we can stand together with countries that are placed in difficulties. We saw what they would like to do with Australia, which is to isolate countries, to, to take a country that, that dares to speak up to China and to, to, to go after them personally in a way that their superpower economy allows them to do or wielding any other instrument of state. When countries stand together, when they stand united, they are by definition a, a, a much more threatening proposition for the Chinese state. So that's the second thing. And the third thing is to, is to put the, the the fear of, of uh, political uh, difficulties uh, 
into the hearts of governments. Our, our view is that governments uh, across the world have failed to move fast enough far, or far enough on China, that this threat is much larger than we have perhaps anticipated. Um, and that real significant proper action is necessary. Uh, and, and what IPEC allows us to do is, is firstly to form um, local groups that come together of legislators. Just this week, we launched at JPEC, the Japan Parliamentary Alliance on China. Um, there's 30 MPs there. They had a meeting. Um, they said some stuff about Hong Kong. The Chinese denounced them, but they're, but they're, they're pushing the Chinese government to take a much tougher line. And our experience from the UK and from Australia as well is that governments are very nervous about this because um, the public at large are um, in great swathes of the world calling for a much uh, more robust response to China. Um, so governments really don't like fighting backbench legislators where they exist um, uh, uh, on these issues because it doesn't look good. And, and it's certainly the case that um, we have in certain countries proven ourselves to have the resources to be able to defeat governments or in votes. Um, and uh, as Lyndon Johnson said, the first rule of politics is to count votes. So that's that's the other thing that we can that we can do. Uh, we've been around for a, for a few months now. Um, uh, we set out. Uh, I, I was trying to remember how many we've got. It's 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 quite it's quite hard work to to keep. But we, we set out with only nine countries. We've now got um, a few more. We're expecting to add um, some very big countries um, in the next few days. But our aim is to have representatives and members um, from all three parliaments uh, around the world in which there is cross-party support for, for a different uh, response. And cross-partiness is important to IPEC. Our, our role here is to, um, uh, 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 17 parliaments, I, I think Matthias has just told me, he, he, knows, he, knows much, he knows much better than I do how many we've got, and 154 parliamentarians. Very good. That's gone up again. Um, uh, uh, where was I? Um, I've been distracted. Uh, uh, so, uh, 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 yes, cross party. Uh, it's inter there's an interesting split in the way parties have developed across the world. So in Europe, uh, continental Europe, it has actually been the case that Green Party, Social Democrat parties, parties on the left have been much more likely than parties on the right to take a tough line on China. And what we've seen is that um, certainly in Germany, the CDU of you know, steady as you go, economic management have promoted trade with China, which is an obvious driver of growth in ordinary circumstances, if only in the short term, in, in my view. Uh, but you've had parties like um, the, the German Green Party, um, you've had the Pirate Party in the Czech Republic, um, uh, you, you've had social democrat parties uh, around the world, uh, around Europe, who have taken much tougher lines on this. In the West, in, in the English speaking West, however, in Australia, in uh, the United States, in Canada, um, in New Zealand, in the United Kingdom, uh, a, a tougher response in China has chiefly been the response of right wing parties. Now, basically, what you get is you've got problems in both countries, but you don't get the crossover benefits. So our view is that um, human rights are not a political issue, that democracy is not a political issue. And this challenge um, won't face us or stop facing us on the basis of which party is in control. If Joe Biden wins in November, the Chinese um, Communist Party are not going to alter their position towards the United States. They just won't. Um, what they see themselves as in is in a historic mission. So um, our role is to, is to keep a kind of consistency that's going and also to remind um, uh, China that um, we are not divided. The fact that we are democratic and we don't all have to speak with one voice on all issues of all policy at all time does not mean that we are weaker than you. And they believe that it does. Now, there are difficulties, of course, of having changes in governments, changes in administrations. Um, we have our own petty squabbles and disagreements. However, our diversity of voices allows us to make the right calls more often. And, and what we want to say um, very, very clearly 
to the Chinese state is that, look, we disagree over whether we should put taxes up and down. We disagree over the rate of decarbonization. We disagree over, um, I, I, I think we have, we, well, we certainly do have members who disagree on massive social issues. We've got pro-life members, we've got pro-choice members. We've got people who would, you know, have absolutely nothing to do with people ordinarily uh, on the range of spectrum. I mean, Marco Rubio in the States is, is not known as a left-wing um, senator by any stretch of the imagination. And the German Green Party are not known for their conservative credentials. But on the issue of China, on the issue of these fundamentals, we speak together to you, China, and you will face us all, or you will face none of us, and you will return to your position as a full and active member of the international community, which is what we all want for you with the free people in China. So, so that's what IPEC uh, wants to do. And um, we've got a number of issues so far. So, so far we've fought um, on issues of, of, of small but meaningful issues on, on human rights. Um, we've issued an awful lot of statements on human rights. We've also fought um, a couple of campaigns um, so we fought a campaign on extradition treaties with Hong Kong. So following the imposition of the um, <clears throat> uh, Hong Kong national security law, uh, we uh, started a campaign to get countries uh, involved who are members of IPEC um, who have extradition treaties with Hong Kong to suspend them. Um, we've had an awful lot of success. The UK is suspended, uh, New Zealand is suspended, Australia is suspended. Uh, the United States has uh, suspended and cancelled, um, and I'm grateful for all of those, uh, not least because I suspect at some point that they're going to charge me under the national security law of Hong Kong, as it applies wherever you are around the world, uh, whether or not you've ever been to Hong Kong before. If you say, as I do, that Hong Kong could be an independent viable country, or that Hong Kong should and is a democratic country, or that Hong Kong uh, the Communist Party does not have a God-given right to rule Hong Kong, you have committed an offence. Um, and uh, uh, so it became, to us at least, unpalatable um, for, for, for Western countries that champion democracy uh, to have extradition treaties that could see uh, political prisoners return to Hong Kong. Where we're moving next is interesting in that we are I think on the cusp of moving into what is the biggest discussion about China. <clears throat> and it is a, uh, a fundamental discussion of a scale that we have never seen before, of an issue that we have never dealt with before, which is we are, we believe, uh, bordering on uh, the verge of uh, increasing uh, tension and conflict with a economic superpower with whom our economies are very closely intertwined. Um, I did, a, the Henry Jackson Society, a, a, a study on how many goods are we strategically dependent on China for, importing more than 50% of the um, uh, net importers and China control, controls more than 30 goods in the world. Uh, Australia was dependent on some strategically dependent on something like 500 categories of goods, the UK on, on, on a couple of hundred. Um, there, there are hundreds of areas of goods in which we have we've grown dependent to such a stage that, that we cannot um, afford for China to suddenly cut off the supplies. We certainly saw it with PPE supplies in the early days of this pandemic. Um, now, that is a really complicated economic question is to how, whether, why, when should our economies begin to unpick themselves from China? Um, it was not something we dealt with um, during the, uh, the the Cold War. We had been the first Cold War. We we'd been dealing with the Soviet Union, of course, closely in in the Second World War. But but fundamentally, while we while um, uh, the UK at least <clears throat> sent um, uh, uh, sh shipments, Arctic convoys of, of goods, we were not dependent on. The Soviet Union in the 50s, we were not dependent on the Soviet Union in the 60s, 70s, 80s or 90s. There were no times at which our economies were closely intertwined. Uh, and that uh, new economic dilemma places this conflict or potential conflict uh, in, in a very unusual position uh, in that we need to continue to train, we need to be a strategic economic partner and we need to recognize that even if we don't, the Chinese Communist Party considers us a strategic threat um, 
that that um, could threaten or jeopardize the entire the entirety of, of the survival of, of their whole political system. And that so far, um, every time that we have taken action in response to a human rights abuse or similar in China, they have used that moment to up the tension, not, not diminish them. And they are increasing the pace at which they are doing that. So it feels likely at the moment that we, are, we will spiral into further conflicts and tensions um, in the not too distant future. So what we are doing next is we, we're first trying to get a, a sense of the picture and there has been a chronic lack of understanding amongst economists, um, global trade bodies, uh, financial analysts about the risks of dependency on China. And it's, it's been unfortunate that around the world that, this, that the risk of decoupling or um, limiting uh, strategic dependency or divergence, whatever you want to call it, um, exists uh, uh, and we need to be ready and prepared for it. So the first thing we would do is, is work on that, but I suspect uh, much more fully towards the back end of the year, as well as all of the, what I call live issues, things that come up from day to day that you've got to deal with and respond to. I think you'll see the China movement worldwide, certainly insofar as IPAC is concerned, beginning to push the really tough questions for governments about how do we look at our economy in 10 years, 15 years, where do we want to be in terms of dependency on China? Um, supplies of mobile phones are a really good example. Um, and the US has taken really strong action in terms of its chip ban on, uh, 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 on supplying any chips uh, to China that have been built with uh, US intellectual property. Is it palatable for the Netherlands? Is it palatable for any European country to be dependent on China for 80% of its laptops? Or cellular phones. Now that's a that's a that's an issue further than uh, the Huawei five G question when it was about our central network and it was a it was a limited strategic risk that you could take a discrete decision on. That is about hundreds of consumer choices. That is about you know Apple choosing to make its phones in China because they are cheaper to do so. Um, and I think we're going to ask some very, very difficult questions about that. And that is going to place uh, enormous strains uh, on um, the way in which uh, business, uh, particularly in countries like the UK um, and indeed Netherlands, that have high service economies um, in which, you know, uh, uh, these companies have been very busily doing business in in China. Unilever, for example, it's a, it's a China is a big market for it on goods, um, but there is a lot of others on services. Um, that difficult discussions are going to have to be to be had there. So strategic dependency will be a big one. Uh, human rights, as ever, with China, we are going to learn more over the next three to six months. Um, I know of some very big um, national international media investigations into it, what's going on in Xinjiang. We are going to learn more and the more and more we are confronted with the facts that uh, over a million uh, Muslims have been rounded up, placed in prison uniforms, forced to kneel, had their hair shaven off, sold as wigs to the Western world, while they are packed into trains, sent to concentration camps and forced to abandon their entire cultural backgrounds and experiences. And while the women are being forced to have um, uh, best case scenario, long-term contraception, worst case scenario, full sterilization. The more and more we learn about this, the more and more we're going to have to act. We're going to see some appalling violence and uh, mass arrests and imprisonments in Hong Kong. We are going to see further action in the South China Sea. Um, and we're also going to see very interestingly what I think will be, um, is probably the least discussed but most important part of where the China conflict is going to go next, which is developing nations. Um, too often in Western discussions like this, we, we obsess about what's going on in our communities, in countries that are like us. Um, but there is a real battle going on right now in Africa, um, in parts of uh, the Indo-Pacific, uh, in Pakistan, um, in which China is attempting through um, so-called investment to obtain a massive control over what's going on in a series of countries in Tanzania, in Kenya, uh, in, in Ethiopia, um, 
uh, concerningly a little bit in Indonesia, actually. Um, we are seeing that China is through debt diplomacy, through plain old corruption, um, it is attempting to build itself uh, a, a ring of client states. And by the way, it's had some success. And the way you know it's had some success is if you have a look at the candidates at UN bodies that China has backed and have a look at the candidates that great swathes of African countries, small coastal states that all have one vote, um, have voted, um, you will find an enormous degree of convergence, an enormous degree of divergence um, with the candidates that um, European countries, amongst others, are voting for. Uh, so there is a big battle to be coming, much like um, the first Cold War, over the client states that um, China is attempting to um, ascertain around the world. Um, and it has potentially devastating consequences for them because as we saw in Sri Lanka, what the Chinese government is quite prepared to do is it will quote unquote lend you the money to build a massive port, only you've got to use Chinese builders to do it. And then once the Chinese builders have left and you can't keep up with the grotesque um, interest rates that you no saying, sane politician would have ever signed up for in the first place, they will simply seize ownership of that port and then they will force uh, you and a number of your assets into a form of long-term servitude. And all of that is being waged on a uh, developing world that frankly deserves an awful lot better. So, so that, is, that is a great difficulty. I think you will begin to see an awful lot more on that. Um, and much like um, in previous conflicts, the big losers will actually be the people who are caught up in the peripheries uh, of, of, of this emerging conflict. Um, so those four things, I suspect, over the next uh, next year, it's it's strategic dependency decoupling. How, how do we deal with the fact that our economies are bound together? Human rights and the appalling abuses, which we're only going to learn more about. Uh, the South China Sea and, and Taiwan, also worth noting, perhaps it's something we can discuss later on, that China has not given up taking over Taiwan. It's now abandoned its aim to do so peacefully. Um, and uh, its desire to build protectorates and client states in the developing world. But those are, those are the four things I think uh, we will do next. Um, and I hope that over the last 50 minutes, um, you've got a sense of uh, how we've ended up where we are, what IPAC's role seems, uh, seeks to be in all of this, um, and what we're due to see very soon indeed. Wonderful. Thank you so much. That's a really good overview, in my opinion. Um, learned a lot, I think. And um, yeah, now we'll uh, be moving into the Q&A section of our uh, lecture. So uh, to start off with, we have a question um, from the YouTube chat. Uh, but after this question, I would, or like during the question, uh, while it's answered, I would like you to raise your hand if you're in the audience. You can either, either turn on your camera and do so in person. I'll, I'll try to see it. Otherwise, um, if you use the function yeah, as part of the Zoom call itself, um, then I'll answer it. Also, uh, questions from both the Facebook and YouTube live streams will get sent to me and I will answer them. Um, so to start off with, um, there is a question, which is, uh, what can individuals in Groningen do to help um, with this whole situation? Well, it's it's a great question, and um, I, I, I'm glad to have it. Um, the the first thing to say is it's all the normal things with any um, NGO campaign or issue. It's um, join up um, various groups uh, locally that are, that are interested in this. It's support groups like Human Rights Watch. Uh, I'm not always the biggest fan on earth of what Human Rights Watch do, but on China they've done brilliantly. Um, <clears throat> It's donate to, to groups that are, are prepared to take this seriously. It's write to your um, local representatives. Um, it's make contact with people in Hong Kong and in China. Civil society links will ultimately be there um, to take it. It's think carefully about where you're buying things from. Um, I, I've begun to think very carefully about uh, some of the things I'm buying uh, coming from Xinjiang. If you like, like I do, Nike trainers, um, it, there is a chance that the cotton in them was made, was farmed in Xinjiang, and there was a chance that it was done using slave labor. Um, 
but it's 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 all the normal things but uh, the, the most important thing i think that is going on that we can all play a role very easily in in china is that globally internationally we are all going through a great awakening a realization of just how bad the situation is and perhaps the best thing we can all do about it is just think about it um, because the moment I think you start thinking about, do you want to do business with a country that is doing all of the horrendous things that China does? Um, in my view, most people f form the con same conclusions that I do, just, just, just as soon as they've begun to really consider it as a, as a top priority for them. Thank you uh, for the very concrete answer. I, uh, yeah, I think that's honestly something we could all do. Um, now we have a question from uh, Wouter. Uh, yeah, first of all, thanks for the, the great lecture. It's very uh, eye-opening. Um, I had a question with regards to the um, the developed nations that you mentioned. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> the criticism uh, that I hear a lot in this discussion is that, for example, uh, Western aid money or eight projects take years to uh, develop themselves. And there's a lot of um, extra rules that developing nations need to hold on to. Mm -hmm. And that's why they choose uh, the Chinese option. Yep. Uh, what, how do you suggest we, we change that? Well, uh, can I just say, it's one of the best questions I've had in a very long time, actually. Um, and um, there is no doubt that uh, the different ways we approach aid have a massive factor. Um, so uh, th there's a few things that go on here. The, the first of which is that um, <clears throat> we've been giving aid for a long time. The support for aid in, in the West um, is always, I think, paper thin. It's certainly paper thin in the UK. There's a lot of nervousness or concern publicly at the level of which we donate. Um, now that is only compounded when money that is given for poverty relief is abused by corrupt regimes. And that is why uh, Western aid money um, is subject to very stringent concerns. That's why we work uh, frequently with multilateral organizations um, or with um, <clears throat> well-established NGOs. Uh, that's why we put high auditing standards on, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> and as you say, the downside of that is it makes it more complicated. The second thing we do is we give aid projects that are much less attractive to dictators, despots, um, and semi-corrupt politicians. Um, in that the Chinese will come and offer to build you a bridge. That's a great, you know, you can, you can stick that on a campaign poster. Um, you know, support for local democracy movements, uh, rice shipments in, you know, is, uh, throwing it off the back as as we've kind of seen the pictures before, you know, I, which I think is, is, you know, is never a pleasant spectacle of how it all works. Um, and, you know, local level investment uh, doesn't seem to work as well. Uh, there are some things that I think we should not do in the West. We should not be in the business of paying off corrupt officials. Um, and that puts us at a disadvantage. But I do think there are ways that we can uh, spend aid better uh, I don't think um, international institutions have always been very effective uh, ways of, of diverting or controlling uh, aid. Um, I don't think the um, certain UN uh, affiliated bodies have actually been good at either directing it or spending it in ways that have aided foreign policy uh, objectives. And it's also worth saying that they weren't meant to. Right. They, they, they've not failed because they've been badly administered necessarily, though in certain cases they were. They've failed because our objective with aid has always been to alleviate poverty. <clears throat> we do not use aid in the West really uh, or frequently in order to achieve our foreign policy goals. But I think moving into a period post the kind of Cold War malaise, post the Fukuyama uh, end of history scenario, in which we will need to, because there are alternate risks. There are there are risks other than straight poverty to developing nations um, posed by countries. And it's not just China, by the way. There are other countries involved. Um, there is aid in the Middle East that Iran is engaged in giving. There is um, Russian action, um, often wrapped up with the uh, work of its private security companies. Um, 
and and, and uh, I've said this for a long time in the UK. I don't know what the um, Dutch uh, situation is, though. I know you, um, uh, uh, that Netherlands has put very strict controls, rightly so, on um, who it is awarding aid to. Um, but we just have to have a fundamental rethink about what our aid policy is in a period of great state conflict, because it's not the same as what it was 10 years ago, because the, the threats to people around the world are different. Um, thank you. Uh, we now have a question from Nina, and then I'll be uh, going through two questions from the live stream. Yes, also from my side, thank you very much for the lecture. Um, I was wondering to tie into something that you also mentioned during the lecture, um, the role of international institutions and especially the UN, because um, obviously the UN, uh, China does have a veto power in the UN Security Council. So is there even anything the UN can do to um, counter what is going on in China? And is that also something they should do? Well, it's, it's an interesting uh, question, and um, <clears throat> I sort of raised it earlier, hoping that it would be asked. Uh, and the first thing is to say, is, as you know, and I don't need to lecture you on it, is that the UN is not just one body. It is made up of uh, a, a, around about 50 different organs. Um, in, when you include uh, groups that are, are so closely affiliated, they're essentially part of the UN. Um, the first thing to say is there is lots the UN can be doing. Uh, the Human Rights Council can, for example, um, accept resolutions and motions on Xinjiang, pass them, on Hong Kong, pass them. It is not doing it. Um, the, the, the second thing um, it can do is um, uh, take a, um, well, so, so look, I think, I, I think there is the symbolic side, which is the Human Rights Council. I think it is the national um, uh, uh, it, it is the Security Council, sorry, and it is the General Assembly, and there, there are a great many things that you would hope they do. <clears throat> the second, actually, I think is where the real conflict is, in which I call what I call the uh, not so glamorous but very important UN bodies. So what I'm talking about here are bodies like the International Telecommunications Union, the International Postal Union, um, the International, uh, what's the, I think it's the International Seabed Authority, um, it's the World Health Organization, it's the World Tourism o Organization. It's all these bodies that it would be entirely possible as a foreign policy professional to never see or hear of, but who are actually in charge of setting really important global rules and standards. Now, China has announced that it's got a, a proposal or a plan called what, what it calls China Standards 2035, in which it says, its basic narrative is this, is look, look, all of the rules for, you know, how I need to build a lamp, how I need to build whatever was set by the West because they were in charge then. So these global standards, the way it all works, the protocols in telecommunications networks, that was all set up by the West. And, and, and their view is it was done for our benefit, uh, for the benefit of European countries, the United States, et cetera, the Atlantic Alliance. Now it says, right, well, the next set, uh, artificial intelligence, biotechnology, a series of these areas, we want to set the rules for. Um, so it has aggressively pursued leadership um, figures into these bodies. And I think that is why you are seeing um, uh, the Trump administration who, with whom, you know, I've got my differences, uh, but I think there were certainly early, early recognizers of, of the scale of the China uh, uh, difficulty. Um, th that, is, that is why you've seen them so aggressively target these bodies and withdraw from some, make very serious noises about what's going on in others. Um, now these organizations, these organs, all can play a firm role in protecting the rules-based international order. Now, we know in the end that China won't uphold all of them. The China is a signatory to the uh, conventions on the law and the sea. It, it signed up to be bound by the tribunal on the law of the sea's decisions and it ignored them. But, uh, these international bodies can, at the very least, um, stand firm and protect, um, protect a system that bases um, power and rule and standards uh, 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 on, a, on a global level playing field. And I think, I think that is where international bodies 
uh, have got a role to play. And I think that is actually where Western countries need to admit that for 20 years or so, they really took their eye off the ball, what was going on at these bodies. And look, they, they make a big deal about the Security Council, of course they do, but Security Council is involved in, you know, relatively small number of big decisions each year. <clears throat> actually, international bodies that you've never heard of are involved in things that actually without you even ever noticing are impacting your lives much more frequently uh so so i think those bodies are really where the battle is going to take place i hope that answered your question nina wonderful um, there seems to be some confusion as to how to raise uh, your hand, uh, since I received a message about that. Um, Yosha, you can uh, click on participants and then uh, click on the hand icon. If you're on your phone, you can also just um, click on the hand on icon at the bottom of your, of your screen. Uh, I'll first be taking another uh, question from the live stream and then I'll moving on to, I think Jan Paul has his hand raised. Um, so, um, Tain Blom asks, um, in what way does the IPAC or IPAC um, interact with China, speaking with Chinese ambassadors or people from the Communist Party of China? What kind of uh, approaches does the, does IPAC choose? Well, so uh, IPAC corporately has had no request from the Chinese to speak to us. Um, they uh, instead um, choose to exercise um, their communication through us through um, denunciations from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, which um, we of course review carefully and um, uh, yeah, we, we, we listen in intently while they're calling us imperialists and all the rest of it. Um, I, I think international members certainly have. I, I, I mean, look, I think it's an interesting way, the ways in which China is engaging with civil society that are concerned and hostile um, overseas. Uh, we at the Henry Jackson Society, uh, the think tank for whom I also work, um, published a lot of papers on China, do a lot of events, uh, many of which uh, upset the local Chinese uh, embassy here. Um, and um, what, they do, what they tend to do is they tend to very politely ask for a phone call and um, they, they announce a phone call and there's always about, well, there's always rather a lot of them at the other end. Um, and um, the, the, there's, a, there's a real joy with um, Chinese communist officials overseas in which they are firmly of the view that their job is to read quite a quite a closely <laughs> closely limited script, um, and um, they read the script to you in which they tell you how um, awful and how unreliable and um, inappropriate and dreadful your research was, um, and then and then they ask you if you've got any questions, and then you ask them a question, and then they read that same script back to you. Um, and then you ask them another question and then you get that same script back. So um, uh, it's, it's, look, I, I've had a number of conversations with officials from uh, China, um, but uh, it, it, they, they can sometimes be challenging conversations on the basis of it doesn't really matter what you say, they'll say the same thing regardless, down to the word. Well, I hope that um, answered your question, Tain. Uh, now, Jan Paul. can just press uh, unmute in the bottom left. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Um, uh, thanks, Sam, for the uh, in, uh, lecture. It's very interesting. Um, well, what I've gathered is that uh, much of the uh, the strategy for tackling like China, I, mean, I prefer, you know, to, to call it the CCP because my, my girlfriend is Chinese and I know a lot of Chinese people, they're all very nice people, but the CCP maybe, is to de decouple the economies of uh, the West and China. Um, and, uh, you know, if it would work, I'm sure it would be very effective. But, you know, what's the, you know, in, in, the, in a scenario that every Western country suddenly becomes aware that they need to decouple from China, what, is, what do you think the time frame is between now and the effects that you want to have uh, to take place and, and without causing irreparable damage to the Western economies? It's a great question. Um, so... Uh, I, I think what I think what IPEC wants to do, as opposed to prescribing any particular economic policy right now, is just to say actually there has been a lack of discussion or realization uh, of this. Um, 
now decoupling uh, will be right for some countries. Um, and I know of um, certainly some IPEC members who said to me, look, we need to aggressively reduce it. It, it won't be right in other scenarios. Um, but the first thing is uh, knowing who you're, knowing the scale of the problem. You can't, you cannot seek to resolve a problem unless, unless you understand it. So, so the first thing we're doing is spending a lot of time uh, studying this, encouraging our members to, to um, ask their governments what assessments they've made of um, strategic dependency. Is this a factor? In terms of is this a strategy or a policy of how to deal with China? No, I don't think it is. Um, I, I think this is um, a, a resulting consequence of having to take a tougher line on China. Uh, I, I don't. I don't think. Um, I, I. I don't think China is going to go away as a problem if we stop trading with it. Um, I, I, I just don't think that's a reality. I, I think we're going to need to consider very carefully any form of dependence on China, um, because. Um, China has shown itself willing to, to threaten to strangle off trade. Uh, so, and, and you're right, actually, to, to narrow it down to the Chinese Communist Party. There is, you know, there is nothing, there is nothing that precludes the people of China who are, you know, amongst the most industrious, um, creative problem solving, diligent, dutiful people on earth um, from being able to sustain a democratic, vibrant government that we all want them to have. Um, it's a problem with the party. But um, it, it's not going to be enough to, to, to decouple this. There's so many other issues, but I think it's I think it's um, it's a matter of the West having to think very carefully about how you deal with a country that has shown it is prepared to use economics as a weapon, as opposed to using it so much as an economics weapon ourselves. But look, I think uh, in answer to your other question about how long is it going to take. Actually, I think business is beginning to do much of it itself. We're seeing that the coronavirus outbreak is making all companies bring, not just out of China, but supply chains closer to home, increasing domestic stocks. So it's got a greater level of resilience. Um, <clears throat> but I expect over, over the next 10 years, we will see a material change with how trade with China was going to progress um, if it hadn't been for, uh, uh, for the coronavirus outbreak. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll now be taking a question from Stephen because he's been having his hand raised for quite a while now, and then I'll be uh, answering, asking a question from Save Us on the Facebook live stream. Um, so, Stephen. Yes, uh, th thank you for the very good lecture. And uh, actually, I have been following uh, IPAC since basically the day it founded. Um, so my question for for you would be uh, also about like the decoupling from China. You said that yeah, it's very difficult because all the manufacturing process are in there. Yeah, but then as far as I know, the manufacturing in China, like especially the cost cost wise, because like everyone moved to China in the first place. Uh, it was because of the cheap labor, but mm -hmm. like it has not been the case since, let's say, around 2015. Like, why not move to somewhere else in Southeast Asia, like Vietnam or Laos or uh, uh, Myanmar, for example? Well, look, it's a, it's a great question. Um, and uh, I, I, I think that exactly the countries that you've outlined are likely to be uh, beneficiaries of people can, uh, looking to uh, viewing of um, the diversification of their own markets. I think it's certainly the case that Samsung has moved um, facilities out in those directions. Um, I think India is likely to be another beneficiary. Um, and what business is looking for, a, a, a good trade, transport, uh, travel links, stable governments, um, at, at, and a reliable supply at an affordable cost. And I think you're right to say that um, China is, has been looking, economically speaking, um, I increasingly expensive on, on a manufacturing base, though you know, it's still obviously an awful lot cheaper to manufacture goods in China than it is, say, in the Netherlands or in the United Kingdom, from where I'm speaking. Um, but uh, Vietnam has been undergoing a, you know, a massive uh, uh, economic renaissance recently. Um, and I think people are seeing that its government is, you know, increasingly stable and um, uh, and looking very promising. 
and it has a good trade travel uh, transport links. So I, I definitely think they're likely to be beneficiaries. Um, my personal view in how you approach this is um, it's better for governments to create the conditions and set the overall national security parameters, but then for individual businesses to make individual decisions. Um, and I think um, it is very likely that businesses that need to be able to manufacture goods at a, a, a low cost in order to sustain the lifestyles that you know many of us here in the West have uh, uh, grown used to with uh, ch cheap, readily accessible consumerist items, um, will seek to move them to, to Southeast Asia. I also think actually parts of South America um, could fall in line to be beneficiaries. Um, I actually think parts of Africa could. Um, uh, and um, uh, that's one of the things I worry about the developing um, nation side is look, you know, uh, Nigeria is undergoing a real um, economic boon at the moment. Um, there's no reason that Nigeria couldn't become a manufacturing powerhouse. It has an enormous population, great links to transport travel. It does have stability problems, but um, <clears throat> uh, I, I think there is scope here for actually um, an end to strategic dependency and more decoupling being a real benefit for, for countries in the third world and, um, and, and having a role to play in um, uh, poverty alleviation. But thanks for your question, that's a really good one. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. All right, thank you for that. Um, so now we have another question from the live stream chat. Uh, Sebas Manders asks, um, your con logical conclusion here. Should China continue on the current course? Uh, is that, uh, should China continue on the current course? Um, is that we end up in some form of a new Cold War on trade and diplomacy? In this case, what is your opinion on the state of, uh, on the state of Russia and their current strategic and economic alliance with China? <clears throat> uh, so that's right, uh, that is my assessment. Uh, Russia is a fascinating one. Um, in that uh, we've seen a lot of economic cooperation with Russia and China um, in, in the border area. They, they, they clearly share a border. Um, I actually don't think that, um, I mean, look, Russia has shown itself to be a revisionist um, power, to be a rule breaker, to be a, a, a great um, a kleptocratic um, country that is run only for the benefits of for the for the gang of thugs that 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 are governing it, um, in, in which Putin has become quite possibly the richest man on earth at the entire expense of the of the Russian people. Um, <clears throat> I I haven't seen Russia in the past few years um, demonstrating itself to be as um, globally ambitious as as China is. Um, you know, where we've seen actions taken by uh, Russia, it's been in Georgia, um, it's been in Crimea, uh, it's been in Eastern Ukraine, it's quite possibly soon going to be in uh, Belarus. Um, <clears throat> but I think, um, I think China is quite happy with Russia being a, a kind of nuisance um, in, in, in the West's face. Um, and, but I don't, I don't see what is likely to be, um, you know, some people have talked about a new axis of evil or whatever. I, I think that language is hyperbolic, but um, I, 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 I don't see that there's going to be a great China-Russia alliance against the West. Actually, I think their interests diverge quite quickly. And I actually do think that in the long term, China poses a, tr a strategic risk to, to Russia. I just don't know if Russia sees that or not. That's pretty uh, a great answer, and I hope that answered Stevos's question. Um, now we have another question uh, from the YouTube, uh, which says, "If we can convince Honinger local politics, the principality, to speak out against the genocide, would that help? I think the city is small enough to risk it, but the second, but the sound would be great." And they also add that many small cities could make a large sound, and it could be quicker uh, than the government of the country to act. So look, I do think um, local government has absolutely has a has a role to play um, uh, in, in this. Um, I, I know the mayor of Prague has been very um, very active in in, in this space. Um, 
you know, I I am broadly of the view that that governments do foreign policy, um, and um, local governments' abilities to change and impact things on foreign policy uh, uh, change by uh, from country to country. Um, but look, I think um, what uh, what local uh, governments can do is is implement national and domestic laws um, to the best of their ability that that cause problems for China. So. Um, the UK, for example, has very strong modern slavery laws. Um, there are too many goods being sold in the UK that breach our modern slavery laws because uh, the country of origin or a country of eventual origin of these goods involved uh, modern day slavery. And I think actually what we need local governments to do is impose those kind of national set of, uh, impose that domestic legislation laws that preclude a country from China from being able to ignore the rules-based order that exists to protect all of us. Because like in the prisoner's dilemma, it's, all, it's always on the, it's always the favor of the one guy who breaches it, right? But, but, but there is a benefit of all following the same code. Um, and, and I think actually that's where um, local and domestic government can play a really strong role in this um, discussion. All right, well, we'll see if they um, actually do anything in the end or not. Well, yeah. um, so we've got one more question uh, from Facebook and then I'll move on to Stephen in the live stream. Um, so Hannah Muller is asked uh, less about the IP EAC or IPAC uh, and more about your own work in life. You mentioned that you have to change your phone in general method of communication frequently and that a friend of yours has been arrested. Are yeah. you somewhat uh, scared of the consequences of your work? Uh... I'm careful about what I do. I don't say anything in front of a phone that I wouldn't be happy to say publicly. Um, <clears throat> I uh, work off the basis that my emails and communication have been uh, hacked. And if I, if I want to say something to someone that's sensitive, um, I, I, I go and tell them. Um, it is not, it, you know, the Chinese Com Communist Party is a dangerous body, right? I, I, they have not shown hence far an ambition to, to meddle too egregiously in the activities of um, uh, Western opponents. Though Anne-Marie Brady, who's the excellent um, New Zealand uh, professor who's been very active on China, um, her house was burgled. Um, <clears throat> but look, um, I am more careful now than I was a year ago and in a year's time I'll be more careful still uh it's it's uh, so fast you know they've demonstrated a willingness I think mainly to engage in cyber crime but you know there's always a fear that uh they might choose to up the ante I wouldn't I wouldn't travel at the moment to a country that had friendlier relations with China than with the UK I certainly wouldn't travel to China Though it's been made clear to me that I wouldn't be welcome, even if I, even if I wished to. Um, just before Stephen, I'm sorry. Uh, a personal follow-up. I'm wondering, are you willing to live with the consequences, uh, should they, whatever they be, um, of doing this kind uh, of? Look, look, my view is that there's, you know, there's right and there's wrong. There's you know politics. I, I've spent my whole career fighting local domestic political battles of a fairly simple you know fairly low level nature and um my personal view is that locking up lock yeah locking up a whole people uh, torturing journalists and lawyers and human rights opponents and trying to take over great swathes of the world is the point where i i i i, I stop scared i stop caring about whether or not it's in my interests and I start caring about um, whether or not it's the right thing to do. And uh, yeah, I, I, I don't think it's right to sit by and ignore that. These are fellow human beings, it's happening to them. I know it's happening to them. I know it's currently happening to them as we're talking. There will be some Chinese poor, poor uh, fellow in China who is being beaten currently by the Chinese authorities. I don't know where, I don't know who, but it, it's happening ongoing as we speak all the time. And I think when you think about that, you, you, you have to take action. Yep, I think it's a very first step. Uh, thank you. 
Um, so now we have another question uh, from Stephen and then from Jan Pao, and then I think we'll uh, end the Q&A. Uh, Hi. So, um, well, actually, this is uh, this has been the most important question uh, for me. Do you think the awakening of the West only comes after uh, the COVID nineteen pandemic? Is because it feels like as if no one sees how many people are in the concentration camps in Xinjiang before all this pandemic ha uh, happened. Before the West really got hit, basically by China, I would say. Yeah, look, I think, <clears throat> I mean, look, I've been active in this for a long time. As I said, I think the issues were starting to bubble away before. I think I think there was a point at which China had now risen to, to the Chinese economy had risen to the stage that the propositions it was putting in things like Huawei had forced West, the Western governments to make a big thing, uh, to, to think really deeply and properly and comprehensively. However, um, I think we are all as human beings pretty um, selfish and self-centered. And until it hit us and until it hit home, we didn't care and we didn't notice. And there is no doubt that uh, COVID-19 has fundamentally made the way in which billions of people across the Western world um, think about China, it, it has altered it. And I think I think people are, are wanting to know a bit more. I think. I think what's going on in China has been the most underreported media story of all time. Um, it's a massive country with a billion people with extraordinary things going on. And frankly, our literacy, our national literacies of China has been far too low. Um, but I think you're right. Um, we didn't really notice as a country, um, as, as governments, as peoples, actually, I think as ordinary people, um, until it hits us at home, and you know, I don't know what to say about that. I don't think it's, I think it's necessarily right, but I, I think it's, I think it's an inevitable feature of what people are like. Okay, thank you. All right, and now um, the final question to close us off, um, and Paul, I hope uh, it'll be a good one. Oh no, I'm sorry, it's not going to be a good one for most of you. It's a very selfish question. Um, I'm wondering, I was part of the Hong Kong protest uh, like one year ago now, mm. and, and um, I was photographed by some kind of a mainland Chinese official. And yeah. uh, secondly, um, my girlfriend just was on screen and you told, you, well, what I hear from you is that you, uh, you have a healthy dose of paranoia. Yeah. Uh, if we go to China to visit my girlfriend's family, are we at risk? Uh I wouldn't take your normal phone with you. Hold on, see, no, oh, okay. um, so, uh, but you know, we're, um, I mean, yeah, apart from, yeah, we have WeChat on our phones and we would bring them. So if, if we would bring them, go to China, would we be arrested? Well, I, 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 I have no idea is the answer. Um, uh, protesting in, in Hong Kong a year ago was not an offense. It is an offense now. Um, uh, the Chinese government are very good at collecting uh, massive global databases. Um, I have seen of databases that are compiled by Chinese intelligence that contain up to 1% of the populations of uh, Western countries um, on which they have data on all of them, uh, or, you know, of a varying degree. Um, but that's an awful lot of people. Uh, look, if your picture was taken in, uh, in Hong Kong uh, during protests by a... Chinese official, you will have been entered into the Chinese mass of data. They have a lot of data. Um, so um, it's, it's, it's quite different. Uh, one of the very important things to realize about China, Chinese intelligence is it doesn't work at all like the Soviet Union system. The Soviet Union was very much about individuals, quite small, small, small spread. China is a much, it's much wider, it's a whole other issue. Um, on which I could speak for an hour, but um, uh, look, I, 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 don't, I haven't seen as of yet um, comprehensive efforts to target um, figures from the West. However, however, there are two, the two Michaels, two Canadian citizens um, in Hong Kong are currently being arrested on charges um, that I consider to be grotesquely trumped up. Um, 
in order to get back at China um, for arresting and preparing to deport the CFO of um, Huawei to the United States on charges of sanctions busting. Um, so uh, look, I think it's extremely unlikely that they are likely to start arresting Dutch citizens of whom there are a large number traveling to China every year. Um, I suspect you're probably more likely to get caught up in other problems related to travel, which happen quite frequently. Um, I think it's certainly like your suitcase is more likely to go missing than that. But um, I, I think we do all need to think very carefully about um, uh, uh, security and, um, uh, and, and how we approach China as it gets more regressive. And I, I've got no doubt that if the Dutch government chose to take tough action on China in some way or another, which by the way, I'm actively involved in encouraging them to do, um, at some point they've shown in the past a willingness to target citizens of countries with whom they have disagreements. So, All right. um, yeah, so don't, don't pressure the Dutch government too much until I've been to China on holiday and then you can go. You just tell me when that is, and I'll um, I'll schedule I'll schedule all the announcements for as soon as you land back. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you so much for that insight and also uh, the personable um, answers as well. I, I hope they were helpful for you, Jan Paul. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for the lecture. Uh, traditionally, we would offer you a token of appreciation. Um, sadly, we can't uh, hand you over a bottle of wine now because it's through the internet. Uh, but we will still shortly send you a voucher uh, for a book um, as to your liking. Um, and um, yeah, I hope uh, yeah, I, ho I hope you enjoyed the experience as well. Um, it was a pleasure to speak with you all and um, uh, you're all approaching uh, international affairs at just the right time. Uh, I actually think the last 20 years of international affairs were in historical terms quite boring, but um, uh, I doubt the next 20 years will be. I would uh, fully agree personally. Um, yeah, that said, um, now we have some uh, few short uh, announcements to make. Um, firstly, uh, following uh, this, we'll have a short break and um, then our uh, digital activity of the evening and uh, online escape room, which I believe you can still join. Correct me if I'm wrong, uh, people of the board. Um, and besides that, we have our introduction days uh, coming up. So on the 19th, uh, of August, uh, Wednesday, uh, we'll have a, a barbecue, hopefully, um, hoping that the weather is still as hot as it is currently. And on the 24th, we'll have our uh, other type of social, which is more intellectual to my taste, uh, intellectual speed dating, so you can get to know some people at the SIP. Um, and uh, thank you all for attending. I hope you have uh, enjoyed this lecture as much as I have. And uh, I hope you'll stick around uh, to talk afterwards. Now we'll move into a short break. Um, and as well, Mr. Armstrong, if you'd like to stick around or if you have to go, uh, we can stay and talk or uh, head off and do some other things. Uh, that said, uh, please another round of applause for Mr. Armstrong and uh, thank you all for attending. <laughs>